thing. So happy to keep us away. <laughs> <laughs> so how is how is uh, how's Manila? Uh, how's Philippines doing? Grover? How's Philippines doing? Oh yeah, uh, well, doing fine. Uh, it's my I went to Manila for the first time uh, in six months. How's, uh, how's Manila? Uh, how's Philippines doing? So uh, Manila, sorry. Oh yeah, uh, well, doing fine. Uh, it's my I went to Manila for the first time uh, in six months. Uh, how's Manila? Uh, how's Philippines doing? So I think it's uh, uh, Manila, sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, well, the way Manila, it's my I went to Manila for the first time uh, in six months. Uh, how is Manila? Uh, how is Manila? Uh, we are getting echoed. Uh, oh yeah, uh, well, the way Manila, it's my I went to Manila for the first time in six months. Hello, Elaine. Hello, uh, Rohit. My video Hi, won't well, work. Yeah, welcome uh, to board. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it tells me my video won't work unless you let me. Yeah, you can try. Try again. We have one minute time. Oh, there we are. Yeah, hi. That's working. Okay. Uh, hi. Hey, Alan. Can I can try my screen? Yes. Alan, can you make a little bit bright light in your room? Yeah, I'm just going to... It's very dark here. Yeah. There we are. Yeah, hi. That's working. Okay. Hi. Hi. Can I make a little bit bright light in your room? Yeah, I'm just going to switch it up here. Yeah, Can I make a little bit bright light in your room? Yeah, I'm just going to switch it up here. Okay. Hi. Can I make a little bit bright light in your room? Yeah, I'm just going to switch it up here. Yeah, I'm just going to switch it up here. Okay. Hi. Can I make a little bit bright light in your room? Yeah, I'm just going to switch it up here. Yeah, now better. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Now better, Alan. Good. I'll keep it mute water. Okay. okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. So we will uh, start uh, now. So I request all the panelists to mute themselves because we are going to play the intro video of our uh, webinar. Thank, you, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for Swastidi, uh, may I start? Yeah, you can. Benita, you forgot to share the sound. Can you please uh, share the sound as well? Uh, 
Siddhi, I think, I think you must do it because I'm getting issues here. Okay, no worries, no worries. Stop your screen, I'll do it. Siddhi, I think, I think you... Uh, Shristi, is everything okay? Actually, I'm not able to share the video right now. Please, uh... Uh, Dr. Rohit, would you just like me to start the introduction? Since the introductory video seems to have some issues. Shristi, can I play from here? Shall I play from here? Yeah, sure, sure, Rohit. Just hang on. Thank you. Uh, Ruichur, if it helps, I can share the screen if the sound works right. I'll try once. Hello? Yes, please try now, Melissa. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Stephanie Young. I'm the treasurer of AP Saw Press, and together with my co-anchor, Dr. Malita, also an oculoplastic surgeon from Nepal, we cordially invite you and welcome you to the second AP Saw Press webinar. Our first AP Saw Press webinar was held successfully on the 16th of July earlier this year, and this is our second webinar, and its title is Challenging Eyelids, a Spectrum of Opportunities. 
So I'd like to introduce uh, our first um, organizing moderator, he's uh, Dr. Rao Hansen. He needs no further introduction. He's our founding member and current president of PP Swap Press. And he's also the current president of the Philippine Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. He's the son of the late Dr. Ruben Hansen Jr., also an oculoplastic surgeon and founding member of the Philippine Society of Oculoplastics. And he did his oculoplastic fellowship at the University of uh, Hawaii and USA under the tutelage of Ryoge Kamara. And upon returning to Philippines, he continued his passion and interest in lacrimal surgery. And together with his father, they did the first laser tear duct surgery in the Philippines in 2000. And Dr. Rohit is our organizer and moderator of this second webinar. He's the vice president of AP Sopress, the founding president of the Nepali Society of Oculoplastic Surgeons. He's the vice president of Oculoplastic Society of South Asia. And he's currently working at Til Til Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology in Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, he has done his clinical fellowship in oculoplastics at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital under Dr. Ellen McNabb, who's our panelist for today as well. And he's been awarded the, um, the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology APAO Distinguished Service Award in 2014. Dr. Kasturi is our moderator for today. Uh, she's the academic coordinator and senior consultant at Sri Sanka Radeva, Natralia, Guwati, India. She's the head of the oculoplastic department as well as the oculofacial aesthetics and cataract and refractive surgery. She did her fellowship in oculoplastics in Sankara, Natralia. She's a re recipient of more than 25 prestigious awards. And she's been the general secretary of OPAI for two consecutive terms. And she's the past vice president of AP Sopress. So moving on to our panelists, our first panelist is the rest is Dr. Ashok Glover. He's the recipient of the Padma Shri Award um, by the President of India for his services to ophthalmology, the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at Sir Ganga Ram Hospital and Vision Eye Centers in New Delhi, the president of South Asian Association of Oculoplastic Reconstructive and Oculofacial Aesthetic Surgery, the chairman of a subspecialty education ICO. He's a counselor at large at APAO, and he's the past president of AP Sopress, OPAI, and AIOS, and has received numerous prestigious awards and orations. Dr. Alan McNabb, um, he's our panelist for today, and we're very fortunate to have him here. He's trained in ophthalmology in Melbourne, Australia, followed by two years of fellowship in orbital lacrimal and oculoplastic surgery at Moorfields, London. He's the current head of orbital plastic and lacrimal clinic at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Mel uh, Hospital in Melbourne for over 20 years, and he has published over 200 papers and many book chapters in this field. Dr. Kat Burkett, um, we're also very uh, fortunate to have her here today. She's from the USA. She's a uniquely dual fellowship trained um, surgeon in both ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery, as well as cosmetic facial surgery in the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics Medicine. Uh, she specializes in a broad range of conditions, including surgical repair of droopy lids, eyelid and eyelash abnormalities, correction of congenital eyelid abnormalities, tear duct abnormalities, socket conditions, orbital and periocular tumors, cancer reconstruction, and thyroid eye disease. Dr. Hirohiko Kakizaki is also one of our panelists for today. He comes from, um, he, he's our past president of the AP Saw Press, as well as uh, Japan Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. He's a professor at Aichi Medical University in Japan, and is also in charge of the Oculoplastic Orbital and Lacrimal Surgery Department. He completed his fellowships uh, under Dr. Uh, Mr. Rama Malhotra at Queen Victoria Hospital in UK, as well as Prof. Dinesh Selva at the University of Adelaide in Australia. And he has published more than 300 English peer reviewed articles and more than 150 Japanese articles and seven Japanese textbooks. Dr. Kelvin Chung is the past president of uh, Hong Kong Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and also our first vice, a uh, past first vice president of AP Sopress and the Education Secretary of ITETS. He's the chief of orbital and oculoplastic surgery in, in uh, uh, CUHA, uh, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and is also the associate, di associate director of CUHK Eye Center. He's also received numerous awards, including achievement awards from AAO, APAO, as well as the distinguished young fellow of the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine. And so um, I'll uh, pass on the mic to Dr. Malita, who will introduce our special guests and speakers for today. Uh, Dr. Malita, your mic is off. Good afternoon, and warm welcome to you all in this Asia Pacific, Asia -Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery webinar too. I, Dr. Malita Amatya, 
acroplastic surgeon at Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology, Kathmandu, Nepal. And I've done my fellowship in oculoplasty and oncology under my mentors, Professor Dr. Rohit Saiju, Dr. Ben Limbu, and Dr. Purnima Raz Karnikar Sthapit. So I take this opportunity to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Francisco Quarantoliano from Italy. Uh, Dr. Leoni is a president of uh, European Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. He is the past president and past secretary of SICOP Italian Oculoplastic Surgery Society. He is an international associate member of ASOPRS. And Dr. Leoni is the director of the Adnexal and Orbital Service in the Department of Ophthalmology of Villa Tiberia Hospital, ZVM Care and Research in Rome. Dr. Leoni has been graduated with first class honors from medical school at Catholic University of Rome. And Dr. Leone is postgraduate of Talmud training at the Department of Ophthalmology of Catholic University of Rome. And he has been awarded by a Diploma of Ophthalmology with first class honors. And uh, he also undertook training in strabismus surgery under the care of late Professor Bruno Bagolini. And Dr. Leone has been uh, done his fellowship in oculoplasty, lacrimal, and orbital surgery for two years at Moorfields Eye Hospital London under the care of John Wright, Richard Collin, and Geoffrey Roos. And in 2014, he was chosen to receive the ASOPRS Merrill Ray Pathology Award for his work on management of porous orbital implants mm -hmm. requiring explantation, a clinical and histopathological study. And Dr. Leonis fields of interest are ptosis, socket surgery, pediatric oculoplastic surgery, lacrimal surgery, eyelid and orbital tumors, thyroid eye disease. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and we will be delighted to hear from you. And now moving to our speakers for the day, Dr. Yunia Irawati. Dr. Yunia is the current president of Indonesia Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Dr. Yunia is the head of plastic and reconstructive surgery division at the Department of Ophthalmology, UI, RSCM, Head of Ophthalmic Trauma Service at JCI Hospital. And Dr. Yunia did her fellowship program in adnexal and orbital disease at Syria Hamamatsu Hospital, Japan. And she has an interest on in clinical and research, mainly focused on eyelid reconstructive surgery, orbital socket, and fracture reconstruction and lacrimal surgery. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. We will be very, very delighted to hear from you. Moving to our next speaker, Dr. Jafar ul Islam from Pakistan. Dr. Jafar is a founding member and first president of Pakistan Oculoplasty Association. He is the founding member of Asia Pacific Society of Oculoplastic and Refractive Surgery, ex vice president APSOPRS, ex president of OSP KPK branch. And Dr. Jafar has done his fellowship oculoplasty from uh, Manchester Royal Eye Hospital, UK, in 1994. And Dr. Jaffer has also been rewarded by the best video awards on oculoplasty surgery, a best poster award, and gold medal for best presentation on oculoplasty. And Dr. Jaffer has also been rewarded by Raza Mumtaz uh, gold medal for promotion of education in the field of ophthalmology. A very warm welcome to you, sir. We will be very, very delighted to hear from you. Our next speaker is Dr. Sunny Sen. Dr. Sunny is from Singapore, and he is the head and the senior consultant of oculoplastic department at the Singapore National Eye Center. And he did his uh, fellowship in adnexal surgery at the Murfield Eye Hospital, United Kingdom. Dr. Sunny is the president of St. John's Ophthalmic Association, Singapore, honorary secretary of St. John's Ophthalmic Association, Asia Pacific. And Dr. Sunny is the vice president of Singapore Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Dr. Sunny is the past treasurer of the Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And our next speaker is Dr. Shokat Orashakur Mili. Professor Mili is the head of the Department of Community Ophthalmology at National Institute of Ophthalmology and Hospital Dhaka, Bangladesh. And she did her fellowship in oculoplasty and ocular oncology under Dr. Santos Hanawar at Center for Sight, Hyderabad, India, and also a fellow of the Eye Cancer Foundation, New York, USA, and also trained in Nepal and Australia. 
Dr. Mili has established the first comprehensive center for retinoblastoma in the country at National Institute of Ophthalmology in Dhaka. And Dr. Mili has been rewarded by uh, several awards like Feroz Azalil Award by OSB in 2003, Australian Leader Leadership Awards Fellowship ALAF in 2009, Acoin Matin Memorial Oration for Award in 2009, APAO Distinguished Service Award in 2016. And Dr. Mili is a treasurer of Ophthalmological Society of the Bangladesh. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am, and we will be very, very delightful to hear from you today. And our next speaker is Dr. Priyamjit Syananon from Thailand. Uh, Dr. Priyamjit is an assistant professor in Ophthalmology, Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Unit, Department of Ophthalmology, Sulalongko on University, Bangkok. Thailand, and she did her post-graduation in ophthalmology from Chulalongkorn University, and she's also the fellow from OPRS Fellowship from Chulalongkorn University and University of California, San Diego. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. And now, next speaker is Dr. Punima Raskarnika Stapit from Nepal. Dr. Punima is an ocular oncologist and oculoplastic surgeon at Tilganga Institute of Kathmandu, Nepal. And she is trained in oculoplastic surgery at LMU Munich, Germany, and then at TIO. She did her uh, fellowship in ocular oncology from Wilsai Hospital, Philadelphia, USA, and Center for Sight, Hyderabad, India. Dr. Punima is actively involved in management of various eye cancers like retinoblastoma, melanoma, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, and she is also actively involved in various academics and research work at Tilganga. Dr. Punima is a life member of Nepal Ophthalmic Society, Nepal Medical Association, All India Ophthalmological Society, and American Society of Clinical Oncologists. And Dr. Punima is a founder board member of the Nepalese Society of Oculoplastic Surgeons. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. Now, uh, may I request Dr. Stephanie for a short briefing in program session. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Dr. Malita, and thank you, everyone. So without much further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce and uh, bring uh, call Dr. Rao Hansen, our current president of AP Saw Press, uh, to give some opening remarks and welcome introduction. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, thank you, Rohit, uh, Stephanie, and uh, Malita for, for that uh, introduction and organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to our colleagues in the Asia Pacific region and all around the world. And um, first of all, the, uh, just give you a brief introduction of uh, Asia Pacific Society of Thalmic Plastic and Reconstru Reconstructive Surgery. It was founded in year 2000 in Manila. And it was uh, through the years we had um, many presidents from all over the Asia Pacific region. And we were supposed to have a meeting in Manila this year. It was postponed because of COVID. So hopefully we're going to have this Manila meeting next year. We will update you on that. And since our first uh, webinar in July, um, now we're organizing, now we're, we have it here, the second um, APS OPRS uh, webinar uh, entitled Challenging Islands, a Spectrum of Opportunities. And we are privileged to have uh, an honor to have uh, prominent colleagues from the Asia Pacific region as uh, speakers and Europe as, and America as well. But I would like to point out, of course, our uh, guest speaker, uh, Francesco Leone is a good friend. Uh, we've been uh, together in, uh, a software's meeting in, uh, in, in Europe, and uh, I welcome him to be uh, our, our guest speaker. And um, I would like also to uh, thank in advance the rest of our speakers who in one way or another helped the success of this webinar. Just some announcements. Our third APS OPS webinar uh, will be, uh, uh, I think this November, organized by the Singapore Society of Optomic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, so watch out for that. And the fourth APS OPS meeting will be a joint meeting by, uh, with, with the International Thyroid IDC Society early next year. Organizers will be uh, Dong Mei Li, our uh, incoming president, and Shalei Leng, who is also the current president of the ITEDS. And hopefully we're going to have um, the APS OPS will have a, a general membership meeting during that time, an online meeting, and, and hopefully have an election of officers during that time also. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, Rohit and his team in Nepal for organizing this webinar. Uh, so far, it's, it's uh, smoothly, uh, it's smooth and uh, running well. And uh, thank you for joining us and enjoy the webinar. Back to you, uh, Stephanie. 
Thank you, Dr. Rao. I'd like to now invite Dr. Kasturi. She's our moderator for the session. Dr. Kasturi, please. Thank you, Stephanie. And really good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And so I'm going to start the first session. The first session is on challenging eyelids. We have lots of interesting cases to be discussed here. So I take this privilege to introduce two of my very good friends who will be starting the session. Dr. Sunny Shen from Singapore. And already Stephanie has mentioned, he's the Clinical Associate Professor of Singapore National Eye Center. And he was the treasurer of the Asia Pacific Society of Optoneoplastic and Reconstructive Surgery, not once, but twice. So this reflects how great Dr. Sunny is in managing the financial accounts of a society. And also he's exceptional in managing the oculoplastic department. Dr. Sunny is presently the head and senior consultant of oculoplastic department at SNEC. He'll be talking on separation anxiety, and this will be discussed by my another very dear friend, Dr. Hirohiko Kakizaki, professor of Aichi Medical University, Japan. Dr. Kakizaki is a past president of the AP Soppers and Japanese Society of Optoneoplastic and Reconstructive Surgery. He is in the editorial board of OPRS and Orbit, and as his name suggests, Dr. Hirohiko manages to become a hero in everything he ventures into. Like his name, uh, like his absolute hero of ophthalmic anatomy, he has performed and published some of the world's finest anatomical dissection in the periorbital and facial region. So the stage is for both of you. I mean, the virtual stage, Dr. Kakizaki and Dr. Sunny, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, if everyone can see the screen, uh, I, I would like to thank Rohit and the team for the invitations uh, to take part in this uh, prestigious webinar series. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Separation Anxiety. Uh, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Professor John Mather, in commenting the case, and thank all the healthcare workers who fight this COVID pandemic. Our patient is a two weeks old Chinese female with no significant perinatal medical history of milk. She was referred to us for mass over the right eye since birth. On clinical examinations, there was a right corneal superior limbo dermoid of approximately 10 millimeters in diameter. There was also right medial upper eyelid colobomas as well as right medial lower eyelid colobomas. There is, however, no other associated deformities. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to say that most of the eyelid colobomas can arise because of fusion problem during embryogenesis. However, this is also possible due to eyelid reseparation problem in the late, later part of the uh, fetal development. And for our patients, it is possible that part of the eyelid actually stays on the corneal surface, giving rise to the corneal dermoid. And I'd like to highlight that the remaining part of the upper eyelid, the thickness is also uneven, as if something dragged on the eyelid and thin it out in some parts. So this is our first problem list. A corneal uh, and superior limbo dermoid, there's a risk of amblyopia, and subsequently there's risk to develop into strabismus. The colobomas can give rise to lagopharmus as well as exposure keratopathy. Because the medial eyelid is involved, we are not certain whether the canalicular system is also having problems, and this may give rise to epiphora. In terms of urgency, fortunately the dermoids is covered by keratinized epithelium and they are quite resilient to desiccations, so the risk of exposure keratopathy is slightly lower. And fortunately, the tears productions in newborns is usually delayed, and therefore, epiphora don't seem to be a significant problem at this stage. So the most important and more time-sensitive problems that we have to handle right now will be the amblyopia. We have performed ultrasound biomicroscopy, which show that Besides the corneal dermoid, 
the rest of the anterior segment seems to be normal. We have performed MRI orbit to show that there is slight thickening of the medial upper eyelid, a soft tissue mass in front of the cornea compatible to corneal dermoid, a surprising addition of medial orbital mass as well, uh, but for the rest of the globe and orbital structures, they are all normal. We perform uh, examination under anesthesia at three months of age because our anesthetic team deems that earlier general anesthetic risk is too high for a newborn. During the sessions, we perform syringing and probing as well as dacrocystography, which shows there is right upper and lower canalicular malformation. There was no drainage into the right nasolacrimal duct. So our updated clinical list. Corneal dermoid, eyelid colobomas, canalicular malformations, as well as orbital mass. It's three o'clock. Yep. So we proceed to perform an anterior lamella keratoplasty to excise the corneal dermoid. Intraoperatively, we find that the corneal dermoid in, involved almost full thickness of the cornea. We then perform an eccentric deep lamella keratoplasty using a corneal graph of 11 millimeters in diameter. With the cornea sorted out, the risk of exposures become more significant. We proceed with managing the uh, uh, orbital lesions with an anterior orbitotomy. We make use of the site of the eyelid, upper eyelid colobomas to perform a medial full thickness upper eyelid split and we excise the orbital lesions on block. Subsequently, we repair the upper eyelid colobomas with a direct closures. And we repair the lower eyelid colobomas with lateral canphotomy and inferior canphalysis. The histology confirmed the uh, corneal dermoids and uh, showed that uh, the orbital lesions is actually also a dermoid. Postoperatively, the child was recovering well and was actually planned for stage two optical keratoplasty when the child is a bit older. However, the surgery was postponed because of COVID. Now the child is 17 months old with severe right ambiopia as well as right esotropia. From oculoplastic point of view, there is still a mild thickening of the right medial upper eyelid. There was no obvious mass, and there's rounding of the right medial canthal regions. We have performed an MRI scan, follow-up MRI scan, to show there's increase in right axial length. Other than that, there is no additional lesions in the orbit. So now, besides the stage two optical keratoplasty, aggressive amblyopia treatment, and possibly a strabismus surgery, we still have some uh, oculoplastic issues to settle and I would like suggestions for how and when. Should we do any medial canthal reconstructions? And how do we address the problem of canalicular malformations in a young child with keratoplasty? Thank you for your attentions. Uh, Dr. Kakizaki, would you like to discuss the case, please? So I will uh, talk about the background and the pathogenesis of uh, colobomas in my talk. So please start my talk, uh, slide, please. Hey, thank you very much. So to understand the eyelid colobomas and the limbal dermoid, we have to understand embryogenesis and, and the management uh, of this entity. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, uh, today's my topic is development eyelid and the management. Uh, next, please. Uh, so development eyelid takes five stages beginning at week six of gestation. Next, please. Uh, stage one is that development eye fold, uh, which occurs with the migration of the dam over the developing lens vesicle. Next, please. 
Uh, say too is that uh, there is views over the globe from around week eight of gestation and remain to months five to uh, six months of gestation. So this uh, field is very important to uh, grow the eyelid uh, a small uh, anatomy. Next, please. Stage three, uh, during week eight to month seven of gestation, formation of a specialized eyelid structure occurs. And the fusion of the folds contribute to differentiation and development of marginal eyelid structures. Next, please. Uh, between five and seven months of gestation, the eyelids start to separate with intermittent process. This may occur by apoptos apoptosis. Uh, next, please. Uh, structure differentiation, this is five, state five, uh, maturation of the eyelid, uh, which uh, is usually complete between month seven with the station and birth. Next, please. Uh, when the orderly sequence of migration and differentiation is disrupted, characteristic patterns of congenital malformation may occur. So for example, cryptosalmos, uh, this entity is uh, eyelid force failed to advance to cover the globe, and cryptosalmos, Added four fuels but failed to separate, and colobomas added for the inter interrupted and adjacent tissues are unable to interlock, interlock to influence to growth, uh, maturation, and differentiation. Next, please. So, added colobomas occur 0.7 patient in uh, 10,000 births. So, this entity occurs sporadically with unilateral way. Unilateral way. Uh, however, Fleta syndrome, Gordon syndrome, Tresocorin syndrome, etc., uh, shows bilateral eyelid colobomas. Next, please. Yes, this is the sample of uh, Fleta syndrome and Tresocorin syndrome, courtesy of Dr. Hatem Taufik. Next, please. So, pathogenesis of eyelid coloboma is multi um, uh, multifactorial. A coloboma may result from an error in ectoderm and mesoderm migration. A mechanical faults such as amniotic band may also cause comprehensive tissue destruction of the developing eyelid. In Gordon syndrome, a, li a limb dermal may exert pressure on the eyelid, resulting in a focal failure of the eyelid development. Abnormalities in the movement of fet uh, fetal growth plate during embryogenesis can also explain variation. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, I additionally explain the organic system development. So, human em uh, embryo embryonic period is defined uh, until first eight weeks of gestation. And this uh, period is divided into 23 Carnegie stages. In addition, human uh, fetus uh, period is uh, defined after week nine until delivery. The main part of the body of uh, form during the embryonic uh, period, uh, namely uh, within two months. The lagomal system is roughly completed until the first 10 weeks, uh, around two to three months of uh, post ovulation. The candelicular lamina uh, become patent until the fourth month of gestation, fourth months, but the lagomal puncta uh, don't open onto the eyelid migration. Um, eyelid margins until the eyelids separate during the seven months of gestation. Next, please. Uh, location in uh, eyelid coloboma. Uh, this is in descending over. First is mid wrapper, second is a uh, lateral wrapper, third is a uh, lateral lower. The most layer is uh, medial lower. Next, please. Yes, management is operation. This is a sample of cutler beard. Next, please. Yes, next, please. A direct closure as shown by Sunny uh, with lateral counterages. Next, please. A bad guard one hand wrap. Next, please. And this is a brief for the technique. And next, please. So incision and the design is similar to blepharoplasty, uh, but the, the difference uh, of uh, blepharoplasty is uh, posterior lamellar uh, removal and the shortened. Next, please. At this situation, uh, please show the uh, light lower slide. 
skin redundancy is shown. So next, please. So I added the releasing incision and the, the suture is continuously uh, performed. The light lower is the uh, picture just after the operation. Next, please. So one week and uh, the lower uh, picture is the two months after the operations. Of course, made a good result, I think. Next, please. So I applied uh, Dr. Hadam Taufik in Egypt and they looked at uh, Lockheed Saiju in Nepal, giving me a lot of patient photographs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kakazaki. Yeah. It was a wonderful presentation. And any questions by any of the um, participants here? Uh, Kasturi, maybe we'll take question at the end of the session. We have 10 minutes time for the discussion. So maybe we proceed for, forward. Uh, now, shall I introduce the next speaker, yeah. Kasturi? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite okay. our next speaker, Dr. Purnima Raj Karnikar. Dr. Purnima is a founder member of Nepali Society for Oculoplastic Surgeons and the Central Committee member for Nepal Cancer Relief Society. And she has been contributing a lot in the ocular oncology service, especially in the retinoblastoma in Nepal. And then Purnima's uh, paper will be discussed by Dr. Ashok Grover. Uh, mm -hmm. We all know that Ashok Grover is a past pres president of Asia Pacific Society of Optoneplastic and Reconstructive Surgery and Acroplastic Association of India and all India Ophthalmological Society. Dr. Grover is a leading fatherhood octoplastic figure in India and the regions. So uh, Dr. Purima will be talking about the eyelid cancer keep coming again and again. Dr. Purima, you're welcome. Please upload your slide. Um, uh, namaste and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, AP Sopras and Dr. Roy Saizu for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I have no financial disclosures to make. Uh, written informed consent has been taken from the patient for displaying the photographs. I'm presenting a 75 years old female who was referred to us with an open wound with paraffin gauze sutured in the right upper lid and medial canthal region following excision of tumor elsewhere seven days back. Regional lymph nodes were not palpable. She gives the past history of painless blackish lesion in the right upper lid three years back, which was slowly but progressively increasing in size. She had undergone excision of lesion with direct closure two years back elsewhere. The reports were not, however, available. About 14 months following surgery, a pinkish nodule appeared in the same site, which progressively increased in size over four months, for which she went to another hospital where the mass was excised by a plastic surgeon and histopathologist showed nodular basal cell carcinoma with all margins positive. Within a week, she underwent wide excision of the surrounding tissue. This time the wound was kept open a paraffin gauze sutured to the margins and waited for a histopathology report. When the report showed two of the margins, superior and medial, was not clear of the atypical cells, then she was referred to us. In our place, when we did the slide review, uh, the solid type nodular basal cell carcinoma was confirmed, which shows showing irregular nest of atypical bacilloid cells with oval nuclei and scanty cytoplasm. The prominent peripheral palisading were also seen. In our hospital, we planned for full thickness wide excision with four millimeter of margin and reconstruction by glabular flap under local anesthesia. This is a picture of the tissue after excision. The black suture was kept here to delineate the correct margin. On the table, probing showed a both upper and lower lacrimal drainage system being patent. Then a glabular flap containing a promising vascular supply was raised. 
The flap was sutured in, in the recipient site in two layers with 6O vicryl for subcutaneous tissue and 5O polypropylene sutures for skin. On post-operative day seven, wound was healing, healing well. Removal of most sutures were done and histopathology report came as all margins free of atypical cells. One month post-operative period, uh, we can see that the medial canthus is well formed. Both lids and puncta were well opposed to the globe and patient was not complaining of watering. This is the recent picture of the patient, which was five years post-operative period. We can see that there is no recurrence. Flap was well blended in the recipient site. The eyebrows, though the eyebrows uh, looked at a different level, but she was not complaining and lacrimal drainage system was intact. Prolonged ultraviolet light exposure in fair skin people and smoking are a well-known risk factors of basal cell carcinoma. According to American Cancer Society, BCC accounts for half of all cancers of the body in the US and they constitute 90% of eyelid malignancy in the Western world. However, it is uh, not the same case when we talk about the Asian population. Um, when I compare the, these five studies done in Asia, uh, in, this, in these studies, we can see that uh, the basal cell carcinoma and sebaceous gland carcinoma have almost equal uh, frequencies. In a study done in China by Xiaoyu et al. in 2018, they had 56.5% of, of BCC and 34.6% of sebaceous gland carcinoma. Another study done, done by Pond Panage in Thailand in 2005, they reported 40.6% sebaceous gland carcinoma, which is more, more uh, frequent than basal cell carcinoma, which was 37.5. In a large study done in India by um, Kalki et al. in 2019, they reported a significantly higher number of sebaceous gland carcinoma as opposed to only 24% of basal cell carcinomas. In a study done in Nepal by Lavaju et al., uh, at all in 2009, uh, she showed 30.6% BCC and 8.1% sebaceous gland CA. In a recent study done by Kafli et al. in 2020, um, they reported 35.7% of BCC and sebaceous gland carcinoma, which are equal in number. The squamous cell carcinoma remains in the lower side as usual in the, as, as in the Western world. When BCC a patient comes to uh, present to us in the early stage like this, we can do wide margin excision of the tumor and make the patient free of the disease for life. But it is always not the case. We frequently get patients we, who, who come late in the course of the disease, which has a large ulcerative tumor covering the bridge of the nose, part of the upper lid, whole of the lower lid, and most likely orbit and eyeball. Though BCC has a quite a good prognosis with very low malignant potential, very low metastatic potential. When the patient comes in the late stage, their morbidity is poor and then mortality may also be high. Therefore, I'd like to conclude by saying that gold standard treatment of basal cell carcinoma of eyelid is wide excision of tumor with margin control by frozen section or MOH micrographic technique followed by proper reconstruction with optimum functional and cosmetic outcome, keeping in mind to protect the cornea by avoiding entropion, trichiasis, or lag of thalamus, and also try to maintain the integrity of lacrimal drainage system. Therefore, my question to the panelist is, with the absence of frozen section and MOH technique, what is the next best option for eyelid tumors like this one? and histopathology reports takes at least one week in our part of the country. It, is it justifiable to keep the wound open before the reports and take the patient to OT twice? Uh, next question is, free screen graft would have, been, uh, would have uh, given better cosmetic outcome, but with compromised vascular supply. Was glabular flap done here the best option considering the age? These are my references. Um, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'd like to thank Dr. Rohit Saizu for this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Purnima. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ashok Grover to make discussion on Dr. Purnima's case. Dr. Ashok, please upload your slide, please, sir.
can you unshare, please, Dr. Punema? Thank you very much, Dr. Punema. That was an excellent presentation and an excellent mm -hmm. result in Thank a you, case sir. where this was a third recurrence and uh, things settled down beautifully. The cosmetic and the functional result was very good. I think this is the wrong one. So minimize this one. So we're going to look at some of the aspects that uh, Purnima has raised. I think one of the most important things that she's spoken about is the recurrences and the way out when a frozen section is not available. So let's look at the all these aspects. So we're going to look at what is the correct margin for a resection because this is what probably made all the difference and why the recurrences occurred. And secondly, is a delayed repair with paracin, paraffin section control a viable modality? So as we know, the gold standard in basal cell carcinoma, and for that matter, for most eyelid tumor, is a surgical excision with negative margins. And the recommended margin for each malignancy remains controversial. We know the various options, the Mohs microsurgical technique, the frozen section control, and the permanent paraffin section techniques, but still not conclusive, but most would move towards one of these two techniques as the first choice. Typical margins, classically three millimeters or so for basal cell carcinoma and more for space sebaceous and possibly even more for Merkel. And of course, um, melanoma is a different category. So let's look at some of the studies, frozen section versus clinical control, a large study of 145 cases with follow-up over five years showed that there was no, no recurrence with frozen section control in 114 cases with an average three to four millimeter margin resection. But in the clinical controls where frozen section was not done with a margin of four to eight millimeter, there were three recurrences. But recurrences do occur even when an end phase frozen section control is used, as these four studies show, with some recurrence rates bordering between 1.2% to 5.7%, um, both in primary and secondary cases, uh, where uh, a resection with frozen section control end phase was done. And uh, the margin of resections, the most technique studies have shown, again in a large series, that you require um, more than three millimeters in 30.6% of the cases and more than four millimeters in 17.3, almost one sixth of the cases of basal cell carcinoma would not do well with just a four millimeter margin. And this is even more in uh, lateral canthal region. Also, the uh, standard three to four millimeters for BCC still showed an unacceptable risk for uh, recurrence. And if the tumor is larger, particularly larger than 10 millimeters, then you probably need an even larger resection. So this study also showed that even with three millimeter resection, one seventh of the cases, one sixth of the cases, and with one, five millimeter resection, one twentieth of all cases will still still have positive margins. So uh, that implies that we do need a frozen section control or a most technique um, or a paraffin control. You can't repair without that because you would carry a significant risk of recurrence as this case ex exemplifies. Now, the second question that Dr. Punema raised was, was midline forehead flap the right choice, choice versus a full thickness uh, skin graft? And there was a question from the audience that uh, says, why not a less is fair technique? Less is fair does work uh, for uh, small to medium sized medial canthal tumors and, and is often a good choice. But for larger ones like this, I would definitely prefer to carry out uh, um, a repair. 
And to me, a flap is always the first choice wherever possible rather than a skin wrap. Here we are lucky that we have a, a partial thickness. We can only take away the anterior lamina and complete the resection. As you'll see in another example that I show, that some tumors present so late that you have to do a complete resection of the lid. Or for most of us uh, see many more sebaceous carcinomas where you have to do a full thickness resection. So a midline forehead flap here is a good choice and I would have done the same and excellent results justify the choice. So this is the example that I was speaking about. This patient had tumor for eight years, a well-to-do patient, but she did not get uh, a surgery done because of uh, the fear. Uh, advised her biologics, but the cost deterred us. She would not take that treatment. So a surgical resection had to be done. And you can see the thickening here. So we had to do a full thickness resection with a defect as large as this entire upper lid, most of almost half of the lower lid. And we had to take a nasal mucocartilaginous graft and a large midline flap, which we made by lobe, which we divided for both upper and the lower lid. Along with that, used a free skin graft as well. And at the second stage, then we could do a reconstruction. So uh, this technique is a good technique and um, works well in our hands where we have to face very large tumors presenting late. Any questions? Sir, that was an excellent presentation, sir. We'll take all the questions at the end of this session one. Sure. Uh, so now I would like to invite Dr. Zafurul Islam who is the founding president of Pakistan Oculoplastic Association and founding member of Episopers. He was a vice president of Episopers. He's a great orator, a great surgeon, and a very dear friend of all of us. So he'll be talking on challenging eyelid reconstruction. And his case will be discussed by none other than Dr. Ellen McNair, who requires no introduction, but it is my duty to introduce him is the head of the Orbital Plastic and Lacrimal Clinic at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital in Melbourne. He has published over 200 papers and many book chapters in his field. His special interests are in orbit and thyroid decompression. And he has trained some very great regional leaders of Asian community, like Dr. Rohit, Dr. Ben Simon, and Dr. Rick. So welcome Dr. Zafar and Dr. Ellen McNair. Uh, thank you, Kasturi, for a nice introduction. Yeah. Uh, I would first of all, I would like to thank uh, Rohit and his team, and also Raul for conducting this very nice uh, webinar. And uh, I hope I will join in future. Also, it's uh, it's useful in these moments where we can't meet each other. So, I mean, I'm I'm sure we are getting a bit late. Time is over, so I will directly jump. I have three cases. If time is less, I can shrink it to one or two only. So my, uh, in this case, there is a, there is a lady. Can you see the full picture or should I make it? Uh, is it okay? Can you see the picture? Uh, can no, you see the slide? Please make it full screen. Uh, hello. Can you see the slide or not? It's not seen. No, no slide. We can see, we can see no, no. the slide, but please make it full, full. Uh, uh, oh, full. full. Okay, okay. Screen, please. Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah, better. Yeah. yeah. This is a this is a about seventy years old lady who had a sebaceous alcas, you know, which was involving about forty percent of the left left upper lid. Uh, the big uh, issue was that it was just near the. It was at the later cancer, the, the later land was. So thus the traditional tensor flap is not possible. Whenever there's any lesion, which is where the small or big, which is near to the canthi. So in those cases, the solution is that people repair the posterior lamella with some kind of a graft, like a torsal graft or maybe hot pellet graft, and then one can advance the mucocutaneous flap. But I found near the cantha, I found uh, uh, the, the pegasture flaps very useful. Like in this study, I just exposed uh, the lateral rim 
and fashioned a six into 10 millimeter of the periosteum. And it's a bit thicker. I, I, I don't, uh, uh, I don't separate too much tissue from the periosteum. So get a bit thicker graft and it's hinge on the rim medially and then rotate it and stitch it to the, to the later cancer, to the, to the torso plate. So that's a, and then rest. What I did for the anterior lamellar reconstruction, I, on the both sides, I, I, I undermined the mucocutaneous area and then did the advancement flap. And uh, you can see the result, even after a big dissection, you can see a nice later canthal formation because of that periosteal flap and uh, a minimal scarring. Uh, actually, this picture uh, looked much better than it actually is, but actually it is also not, not bad. So this was, so the message is that whenever the region is near the canthi, the periosteal flaps for posterior lamellar reconstructions are really very, very good. So any remarks on this, especially from Alan? Or should I go to the, my second presentation? Yes, sir, you can go for the second. We have okay. time for the second. Okay. This is another case, a 70-year-old male with basal cell carcinoma involving the lower lid, median two-third, and involving the canthal region. So here there are a number of possibilities we can do. There is a, a, a kind of a big, huge flap, but it won't reach the, the median canthal, so we can always make a periosteal flap. Graft here and then make a big cheek rotation flap for anterior lamellar reconstruction. But in this particular, I took a big tarsal graft from the same upper lid, it's about 20 millimeter long. And I reconstructed the posterior lamella and for the anterior lamella, I did nasojugal flap. As, as a, it's an old lady, there's a lot of tissue available. So I'm it and it had a nice, really nice outcome. Unfortunately, I haven't got, I missed the post up, later post up picture, but it was very good results. So here, we should have a number of options available for us, especially you can see how much meter canthus is involved. So in such cases, uh, uh, a posterior lamella with a tarsal graft and, and the anterior lamella with the nasojugal flop is is a very helpful rather than making a very big uh, cheek rotation flap. And number third one is uh, a, a trauma a trauma case. This uh, uh, this person had about years ago, and when he presented to me, uh, he had a malposition of the later canthus. And, uh, and also it toses, which was good, good levator function, about 12 to 14 millimeter. So the question is, should it be a two-stage surgery or one stage? His visual functions are normal. Some people prefer one-stage surgery, doing both the canthal repositioning and the levator sections, probably kasturi like that. But my preference always is two-stage surgery. Uh, here I did a typical very Z flap here. This is the point where I would like to take the later canthus and do, may, did make that Z and then did some undermining and sutured the later canthus to the periosteum. You can see the post-up picture. Now it's at its position. And then I did, uh, elevator section and you can see a nice uh, elevation of so here the question is should we do one stage or two stage i found this two stage surgery more predictable results are more predictable so therefore that these are the three cases which i wish to present so now the house is open for any questions or any deliberation Thank you, Professor Zephyr. It was an excellent presentation. So may I call upon Professor Ellen McNeil to discuss this case, please? Uh, Professor McNeil? 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, just getting my talk up here. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Uh, well, firstly, thank you, Dr. Zafar, for really illustrating so beautifully um, some of the techniques at our disposal, at our disposal no, uh, for reconstructing full thickness eyelid defects and, um, and lateral canthal dystopia. Um, I, I wanted to also thank uh, uh, Dr. Saju Rohit, an old friend and a former fellow um, who I remember with great fondness as one of our fellows, uh, many of which we've had over many, many years from many parts of the world. And Rohit was certainly one of our uh, very best fellows over uh, that whole period of time. And um, it's great to see Rohit uh, has gone on from strength to strength and uh, built up a successful practice, not just in Nepal, but also a great international reputation. And that's fully deserved. It's great to see you, Rohit, and congratulations on this meeting. Um, so look, I just wanted to briefly run through some of the challenges that Dr. Zafar has, um, has raised with his very beautifully illustrated talk. And um, this is all pretty basic stuff, but uh, eyelid reconstruction uh, really brings out the best in oculoplastic surgery. I think it, it, it requires of us not just an understanding of the basic principles of uh, this type of surgery, but also uh, brings to it an element of creativity. And uh, that in itself um, tells us that there's always more than one way to repair uh, the sort of defect that we've seen illustrated, not just in Dr. Zafar's talk, but also the, the previous presentation, which was uh, also uh, complemented this uh, current presentation. So in general, the, um, the principles we follow, of course, uh, we want to assure ourselves of complete excision of the tumour. And um, Dr. Grover has uh, very nicely illustrated the importance of margin control, which, of course, the, uh, the uh, accessibility to things like Mohs micrographic surgery um, is limited in certain parts of the world. We have the luxury of, of separating um, the excision of tumours in many difficult cases and passing that on to the, the Mohs surgeons who then return the patients to us for reconstruction. And in many ways that removes one of the uh, potential difficulties with patients who have uh, largest tumours. And that is when you're doing both the excision and the reconstruction, you're sometimes a bit hesitant to uh, go as widely as you perhaps should because you know that you're gonna have to deal with a challenging reconstruction, which is gonna be made all the more difficult by having a much bigger defect than it would be if you perhaps uh, crimped a little bit on the margins required. So it is an important um, uh, consideration and separating the excision and the reconstruction, I think, does uh, increase the likelihood that you will gain complete excision of that tumour. In terms of outcome, we want to have a functional eyelids uh, and of course, a, a very good aesthetic outcome as well, if we can achieve that. And for full thickness eyelid defects, we all understand the, the principles here as well. And for smaller defects, direct closure works well. The next step is usually cantholysis to allow you to advance either the upper or the lower lid to close a defect. And then there are a number of lateral advancement flaps have been described. And uh, you can separate the repair of the lamellae as was very nicely demonstrated in Dr. Zafar's second case, where you can take a, a, a graft and cover that with a flap, or you can have a flap covered by a flap, which you might uh, achieve by something like a Hughes flap covered with a local skin flap, or you can have a flap on the posterior lamella with a graft, which is the typical way that one would, of course, perform a Hughes flap uh, with a full thickness skin graft. But of course, we never place a graft on a graft because neither of those has a blood supply. Um, for the posterior lamella, um, you have the option also of a flap or a graft and the flap that uh, is commonly used as a fairly, fairly workhorse procedure, at least in this country, is the Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S procedure. But there is an alternative when you have a laterally placed defect in the lower lid to use a laterally based tarsoconjunctival flap, which was very nicely described by Eva Hughes, H-E-W-E-S. And a number of different uh, graft materials are of course are available. Tarsoconjunctiva is very nicely illustrated in the previous talk, uh, buccal mucous membrane or hard palate or nasal mucosa, and then composite grafts, which can either be taken as a full thickness graft from the opposite eyelid, 
uh, or nasochondromucosal grafts can be very useful as composite grafts as well. And for the anterior lamella, we have the option of either a flap or a graft. And I would agree very much with uh, Ashok Grover that a flap is very much preferable if, if, uh, if it can be achieved uh, in terms of giving a better uh, aesthetic outcome compared to a full thickness skin graft. Um, the first case that uh, Dr. Zafar showed us uh, illustrated very nicely the, the utility of a periosteal flap. Um, but there are other options, of course, and uh, I would usually in that scenario, rather than using a periosteal flap, perhaps take a tarsoconjunctival graft for the posterior lamella. It, it certainly provides a, a better surface against the, the globe compared to periosteum. And one of the challenges of upper eyelid reconstruction is to maintain stability of that lid margin, where if you aren't careful, you can have skin and lanugo hairs rotating downwards onto the ocular surface and creating discomfort for the patient and potential corneal complications. Um, one other option might have been to, to slide a tarsoconjunctival flap from the residual medial tarsus across to fill that uh, posterior lamella defect. And again, that might be uh, preferable in terms of providing a good surface for the uh, cornea and conjunctiva. But in that circumstance, there might have been a challenge in controlling the uh, eyelid height at the end of the procedure. The second case um, showed a very useful uh, technique for the full thickness medial defect, which extended onto the medial canthus. But again, there were options. We would often repair this with a, uh, a Hughes flap, which does, of course, have the disadvantage of being a two-stage repair. And although you do have a defect extending onto the medial canthal area, you can easily cover that with a full thickness skin graft. But of course, the match in skin color and texture is not as good as you might achieve with a local skin flap. A tarsoconjunctival graft from the upper to the lower lid um, with a local flap does provide a better skin match. And the third case, which uh, again, there was a, an excellent outcome from this man with quite significant lateral canthal dystopia and traumatic ptosis. I would agree that separating the canthal repair from the ptosis is, is preferable and you're more likely to achieve a good result as was illustrated by separating the two uh, procedures. Um, the flap described is not, of course, the traditional Z plasty, which is used for uh, elongating scars, but rather a transpositional flap, which is a very useful technique uh, um, where you have canthal dystopia and you have potentially shortage of, shortage of skin above or below the canthus and you want to transpose some, some skin from above to below or vice versa. And you can, of course, use that medially as well. So in summary, I think this has highlighted the challenges and the rewards that come with uh, eyelid reconstruction. It's certainly one of the more enjoyable aspects of, um, of my practice and uh, living in a country like Australia, of course, we have to deal with a lot of skin cancer. Um, but I think it's been very nicely illustrated and, and thank you for the speakers who have spoken here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alan and Jafar. Now, looking at the time, we will proceed forward to invite Dr. Yunia Irawati from Indonesia. Dr. Yunia is a Director in Ocular Plastic and Orbital Department in Jakarta Eye Center and one of the leading ocular plastic surgeons in the country. And Yunia's presentation will be discussed by Dr. Kelvin Chong, uh, who is the one of the another leader in endoscopic orbital and lacrimal surgery service in the region. Uh, Dr. Yunia, over to you. And looking at the time, uh, you are given eight minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Rohit, for the nice introduction. Uh, just a minute. I just uh, opened my file. Sorry. Just a minute. Oh, oh sorry.
Kinya, are you loading your file? Uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can can you see my slide, Doctor Rohit? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Please, please go Thank on. You. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, all the participants. It's um, to, to be honored to me uh, to be able to and my share my case uh, with all of you. And my talk today will be about a helpful in of to reconstruct uh, medical mechanical blepharoptosis. I have two cases. Who first uh, male, 37 years, uh, male with a chief complaint of right upper eyelid mens. Since uh, one year ago, it become bigger which caused uh, his eyelid to droop and interfere with eyesight. The visual acuity is 6 over 75, and the mass is 3.5 cross 2.5 and 1.5 centimeter, well-defined, border, nodular, soft, and mobile, and there is pen, uh, no pain risk. The eye movement is mildly restricted to the temporal side due to the due to the chemosis of the temporal region uh, of the bulbar conjunctiva. There is no RAPD. The sensibility of cornea was normal. The anterior and posterior examination uh, will be the normal limit. We diagnosed this patient with mechanical blepharoptosis uh, due to the nodular tumor. And we manage this patient with the bulking procedure followed by sending the mace to the pathological examination. Afterward, uh, we performed the palpebra reconstruction. During the surgery, we, form, we found that the tumor was encapsulated, had a clear border, and not infiltrate to the levator muscle. And we performed the transverse skin resection of the upper eyelid and also the lateral cantopexy and the cantoplos. First, we incise the skin horizontal, measuring the 5 mm from the eyelid margin on the lip crease, similar with the fellow eye. The high was measuring, um, and then uh, we do the blunt dissection, was performed to separate the encapsulated tumor from the surrounding tissue. After we exercise the tumor, we could identify we could identify the excise, uh, excessive skin. I, I mean, uh, I could uh, see the intact of the levator muscle. This is when uh, we remove the nodules encapsulated tumor. And then we mark the excessive skin with the transfer skin excision. Keep in mind, the bench mark is always the fellow eyes, and we mark the excessive uh, skin, and we made the three dots parallel from the central pupil, and then uh, the medial and the lateral uh, limbal. And again, we measured the distance from the skin trees to the eyebrow. And we performed the cantotomy followed by measuring the horizontal eyelid margin. After that, we fixate the lateral tarsal to the periosteum or do the cantopexy and perform the cantoplasty conceptually. At the end, we, uh, we perform the skin crease by suturing the skin to the tarsal frame. And we can see in here, this is the before and post-operative picture. And we can see the patient was completely satisfied with the function and aesthetical outcome. And my second case is a boy, eight years old, complained with a mass of the upper eyelid since he was uh, six months old. From the picture, we could not see uh, the right eyeball because it was covering by droopy eyelid. And on examination, we can see there is a mass, 3.5, cross 3, cross 
centimeter was seen in the right upper eyelid. And then the mass had an indistinct border, immobile, and it make uh, the conjunctival uh, tarsal was averted. From the anterior and posterior segment was in, within normal mean, limit. And from the MRI, we can see the compact mass which involved the right superior papabra and the right extra orbital area, particularly the superior side, and sub, uh, cutaneous and subcutaneous region and the right temporal. This is the picture of uh, this patient. I saw the, the video. Uh, I make the incision uh, like the lead crease height and the similar uh, in the, at the fellow eye and then excise all the uh, mass and I did the contopexy from the medial and after I do the transverse uh, skin excision and conjunctival and then I suturing the lateral cantal I mean, I fixate the tarsal plate to the periosteum, make it the cantopexy and then cantoplasty. And after that, I make it a larger the skin incision to the indelectris. And I use it the fasciolata graph for reconstructive the ptosis eye. And I, I take the fasciolata graph. The white is one centimeter, like a corneal white, and then a 2.5 centimeter length to hanging to in the eyebrow. And I make it the tunnel. This is I suturing the fasciolata graph with a 605 krill. And then the fasciolata graph go pro to the tunnel. And I suturing to the frontalis muscle. Okay. In here, we can see in the lower eyelid, there is a like uh, trichriasis or epiblepharon and I did the reconstruction with the tarsal fixation for the lower eyelid. I think this is a one, post, one day post of one week and one month post operative. I think uh, this is uh, my, uh, my slide at the end. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, Dr. Kelvin. Dr. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Kelvin, please. Please. Yeah. Please load your slide, please. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, Dr. Kelvin. Thank, thank you, Yunia. Just stay with us. Yeah. Just a second, please. Thank you, Rohit and Rao, for the invitations. And I'd like to discuss the um, cases as well as the nuisance that we often met as a plastic surgeon in handling mechanical blepharitosis. I have no financial disclosure. And I'd like to um, try to ask for no screen capture during the whole webinar. Well, uh, the, there are two questions that were supposed to me. The first question is, when is the right time to go for surgery? And I think it follows mainly um, similar to other causes of ptosis, and mainly due to vision and suspicions. So in children, like um, Junior's second case, uh, the concern of embryopia would be enough causes to go in for surgery. And in adults who have only or the, um, the seeing eye, like in this patient, who has exaggerated for a malignant uh, disease on his left, come in with a tape on the right remaining eye, 
because of the um, increasing worsening of periocular swelling. We are not only concerned about vision, but we are also suspicions of the uh, ongoing process on the periocular region. And turns out he also has a subcutaneous extensive metastasis from the contralateral socket. So what are the precautions to be taken during neurofibroma removal and chances of recurrence in such cases? I'd like to say neurofibromatosis would be one of the more challenging causes of mechanical ptosis. Um, we'll try to preserve normal tissue, although we all know that plaques of neurofibroma mostly occur in the lateral part of the periocular region from the lacrimal gland and uh, a lacrimal nerve, pardon me, and it would be essential to identify and preserve as much as possible normal tissues. Bleeding is always a concern for those who haven't been um, haven't been operated on a uh, plaques from neurofibroma, I can reassure you the bleeding would be a challenge. And obviously we use all the P's we learn from medical schools. And sometimes for extensive cases, uh, I've tried preoperative embolization, it, it does help a lot. And of course, intraoperative use of glue and hemostatic agent would be useful as well. There are studies, although not randomized, but we all know that the risk of recurrence will be higher when surgery are performed before puberty. Well, back to the topic of mechanical ptosis. Well, either there are eyelid or periorbital lesions which are discrete or infiltrative, like in the case of plaques from fibroma, mechanical restriction either in the orbit or mechanical restriction in the eyelid itself. We call that taprotosis. Uh, for example, in patients with extensive burn can also cause this mechanical ptosis. I myself uh, slightly uh, leaned over to a staged operative approach in terms of mecha managing mechanical ptosis. There are some key references I've listed here because I like to have the ability to re-evaluate re the remaining levator function after either debulking the lesions or grafting the anterior lamina. Most importantly, I like to assess the Bell's phenomenon, the ocular surface, and sometimes, um, quite often in my practice, the protective ptosis would be helpful and many patients might not opt for second stage ptosis correction. This is a patient who comes in with near complete ptosis on the external examination, he had poor levator function, but in fact, he has extensive infiltration of the ocular surface and uh, by simple conjunctival um, biopsy, you confirm this is a case of amyloidosis. And on the other hand, this patient comes in with apparent ptosis. She has mechanical restriction due to a previous history of retinal explant uh, that was placed in the upper orbit. And um, as mentioned before, there are various nomenclature talking about the template technique that is useful, quite useful in, in, in cases for reconstruction due to plexiform neurofibroma. And these essentially the, um, based on the dimension on the contralateral normal eyelid. And we try to base uh, remaining naso-based a flap of eyelid tissue with eyelashes, and we excise these and suture it by layer. So this is one of my uh, cases. I don't have a huge collection of uh, neurofibromatosis uh, reconstruction, but I do see a few of them. So this patient has a forehead lesion, but most bothersome is the extensive lesion on the left socket. She has complete ptosis um, in primary gaze, and the issue is she has difficulty because of the growth on wearing spadicles for her fellow eye. And she has poor vision due to um, amblyopia. So this is how template technique works in situ. you. And I can reassure you these cases really bleed uh, quite a bit. So sometimes or more extensive cases, you have to have other mechanical um, ways of stopping bleeding and put in a drain for maybe the first two days. So this is her pre and post-op. I cannot say that she looks completely normal, but she is happy because she can put back her spadicles for her fellow eye. She unfortunately developed very, very severe dry eye. Although the eye looks um, white, he has extensive near complete uh, pante epitheliopathy, and she opts to observe for the moment. Of course, sometimes staged procedure will be useful too for patients with um, not a lot of uh, uh, a fair to poor levator function, a sling procedure would also do the same. 
Just to conclude, sometimes tax formula of fibroma can be quite extensive in cases like this. So in this patient, we actually did um, exenteration and there is um, dural defect here. I mean, the bone defect with dural show here ultimately need a free flap for reconstruction. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kelvin, for the wonderful and the elaborative discussion. So I call upon Dr. Shakat Aramili. She is currently the professor and head of the Department of Community Ophthalmology at National Institute of Ophthalmology at Bangladesh. And she is the current vice president of Bangladesh Oculoplastic Surgeon Society and contributed for ocular oncology with special interest in retinoblastoma. So Dr. Milly will be talking on the eyelids, play to win, and this will be discussed by none other than Dr. Ashok Grover, who is the president of the South Asian Association of Oculoplastics, Reconstructive and Oculofacial Aesthetic Surgery. He's the chairman of Specialty Education of Internet, International Council of Ophthalmology. He is a father figure to all of us, and he is the past president of Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmoplastic and Reconstructive Surgery, the Oculoplastics Association of India, and the All India Ophthalmological Society. It's four o'clock. Dr. Grover is also the counselor at large of the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. So I take this honor and privilege to call Dr. Milly and Dr. Ashok for the case. Dr. Mili, please. Uh, yes, um, I want to uh, go behind. L let me stop and do it again. Um, thank you, Dr. Kasturi, for your kind introduction. And, I, and thank you. APSOPRS for giving me this opportunity to be with you all today. And special thanks to, special thanks to uh, Raul Hansen and uh, Rahul, uh, Rohit for, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm having some problem. Fine, we are. We can see the display. Okay, uh, I will be present. And thank you, uh, Rohit and uh, Raul Hansen and your team for giving me this opportunity to be here today. And my presentation will be on. Uh, Milly, can you make a full screen, please? I'm. It is visible. Yeah, just make a yeah. full screen. Thank you. Okay, good. So I'll be presenting two eyelid cases today. You know that the uh, eyelid is always a challenging. Uh, uh, thing to do, and my cases are process and uh, on lead can uh, lead growth. First, I will be presenting a case on congenital ptosis with Markov's jaw winking phenomena, and this case was a 18 years old girl. She presented to us with drooping of upper eyelid since birth, and she had retra uh, retraction of left upper lid with jaw movement. She came for correction of drooping eyelid as her parents wanted her to get married. And she has been rejected many by the groom's family for this uh, eyelid condition. So this was, the, uh, this was the girl with moderate ptosis and with uh, eye uh, movement, eyelid movement with jaw. So we did the workup and the visual acuity was uh, normal in both eye. Her uh, corneal reflex was central, ocular movement full in all gaze, and her palpable fissure height was 10 millimeter in right eye and 7 millimeter in left eye. And she had LPS function poor in the left eye and go good in right eye. Bell's phenomena was good in both eyes. And most importantly, she had Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomena, which was present in left eye and with uh, jaw movement, it was more than three millimeter lead retraction in the uh, left eye and it was very obvious. And other things were normal, uh, corneal sensation was intact. And so uh, the, the uh, decision was, we have to make the decision what to do. And ideally we have to do the LPS disinsertion 
LPS excision and transfrontal sling. But the dilemma was, should we do the unilateral surgery or bilateral? And about, should we go with uh, one sitting uh, surgery or do it in two sittings? And we had to sit with the parents of the, children, of the girl and had to decide on counsel them. And finally, we, uh, we came to a consensus that we have to do it unilateral because they didn't want to do it in bilateral. And I decided to de do it in one sitting as I always do. So after the surgery, I did, this is the uh, girl. You can see that the ptosis is corrected very well and excellent correction and almost no retraction of the upper lid with jaw movement. So the patient was very happy and her family was happy. And I'm, I was also very happy and no post-operative complications. We encountered, we encountered, uh, encountered. And the thing is, uh, with the, after this, the girl was get, got married and she has a very happy life now. So it has a social impact also with that uh, surgery. And my second case is about the eyelid growth. This was a lady of 65 years old. She had a very huge eyelid growth involving upper lid, upper lid, medial and medial canthus and the lower lid. And she said that it was, uh, she's having this problem for six months, but I think it was more than that. Initially very small, gradually increasing in size. Almost it was 45 millimeter into 40 millimeter in size. The margins were rolled, slightly pigmented margin, central ulcerated lesion. Visual uh, acuity was 6'9 six, six in, six, in both eyes and both eyes had early cataract. But uh, she, ca she came very late and we planned that to do excision with four millimeter free margin with frozen section biopsy and reconstruction under GA. But, uh, this was after excision. You can see that large wound, almost half of the lead, upper lid is not there and the full, whole lower lid we have to remove with the medial canthus. And the report came on frozen section biopsy. First, it came that the uh, lateral end of the upper and lower lid were um, involved, positive. So we had to do uh, more excision and send it for uh, histopathology again, and then we closed it uh, uh, after the report came. So the decision was what to do. And there is a huge, uh, for the lateral part, we, we uh, planned for huge tarso conjunctival flap. And for the medial end of the upper lid, for, we planned for glabular flap. And for the lower lid, skin graft, hmm, free skin graft. So after we did the uh, glabular flap and huge procedure, this is this, it, how it looks. And finally, it looked like this. I did it just before uh, three weeks, so I don't have the final post-operative picture right now. This is how it looks on last follow-up. Huh? So, and what was the challenges in these cases? We have to do decision making was a big challenge because uh, those, these were uh, we have to have the optimum outcome, and that was very challenging for us to do to take a uh, decision make and patient compliance and counseling. We have to sit with the uh, patients and the parents and then decide what we will do. In the first case about the unilateral or bilateral surgery and in the second case that we have to make them that we have to take flaps and drafts and then they understood the situation. And we had to have a very expert, expert surgical team. And post-operative care is very important. It is not that we do the surgery and leave the patient, but we have to take care of the patients for, in the first case, for any exposure keratopathy and in the for the wound healing, good wound healing, we need to take good care of the patient. And in conclusion, I would like to say that managing cases of ptosis or lead growth is always challenging. And but we have to choose the best management to have the best outcome. Protocol-based management is satisfying outcome. Counseling and follow-up is crucial. And I have a question to the panelists. I have just want to know that what could I have done better in both the cases to have better outcome? I uh, will appreciate your valuable opinion for all the oculoplastic 
uh, we have all the doins and stalwarts of the this region. So I would like to have your opinion in these cases. And thanks for patience hearing and being with us, with me. And thank you, APS OPRS, for again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. To Grover, please. Thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. Some very nice results, which we really enjoyed uh, watching and um, the correct making the correct choices and giving excellent results to the patient to their entire satisfaction. So um, let's go to the tumor case once because uh, that has been discussed in detail earlier. So we'll just pass over it shortly. So she had to do a deep, again, because this is a, a very large tumor. It has presented lace possibly for five years or more. And so she's had to um, take remove the full thickness lid and uh, she's reconstituted the medial canthus very well. The angulation is well maintained and with the glabella flap and the skin flap, uh, the skin graft, I think the result is really nice. So excellent choice of surgery and uh, I would say very good result for a huge tumor like this. And the rest of the things, pros and cons of uh, glabella flap and midline flap, we've already discussed. Uh, so I think we'll pass on to the management of the jaw winking case. I think we, we need to appreciate your great work, uh, Millie. Okay. Um, the jaw winking ptosis patient, uh, we'll look at the possible options. When we take a decision regarding plan of management, we look at the severity of ptosis, the excursion of jaw winking, and associated ocular motility problems, which are present in almost 55% of the cases. And uh, almost 16% of the cases that come to us are with jaw winking. That's probably a referral bias. So the ocular motility disorders like um, the double elevator palsy or the monoocular elevation defect with hypotropia is a common problem. There is an associated uh, amblyopia. We need to tackle the ocular motility disorder before we do this. Very often a NAPS procedure or an inferior rectus surgery followed by NAPS. Um, there are three reasons for that. You improve the position in primary position, which gives you a much more gratifying positioning of the lid and result. The Bell's phenomenon improves and the pseudotosis element is gone. So, so when you uh, have a significant excursion, you need to take a get rid of the Marcus gun. If there is a se severe enough ptosis, that needs to be taken care of. Some cases with just jaw winking with very little ptosis, those are relatively rare. You, you really avoid any kind of uh, um, uh, surgery because you are weighing between the lad, lid lag and lag of thalmos that you will give in exchange for removing the jaw winking. So if, if the jaw winking is not that significant, you often avoid surgery in those. But wherever jaw winking is significant and there is significant ptosis, you would do eliminate both but at the same time, as uh, Millie mentioned, you would try and get as much symmetry as possible. So levator extirpation is important, large number of methods for that. What I do is uh, right up to vitnals, cut all the horns, excise the uh, levator aponeurosis, but making sure I don't do any dissection between the tarsus and the um, orbicularis on the tarsal plate because I'd like to do my slings in a closed method because that gives me a much better contour without fixation onto the tarsal plate. So then of course you need to correct the ptosis using one of these uh, sling materials. For bilateral, I always prefer fascia lata. For unilateral surgery, I always prefer elastic because with fascia lata and unilateral surgery, I often tend to get what is called the habitual palsy or the habitual underuse of the frontalis and an under correction, which you can compensate with the elasticity of silastic. So did Millie achieve all the objectives? Yes. As far as the patient's desire for this case was concerned, yes. But if a patient desires a symmetry as well, then possibly you need to do more. And uh, because of the fact that you would have an asymmetric lag of thalmos and lid lag, 
So let's look at this example with a um, ptosis on the right side with jaw winking in this child. Uh, this is the pre-op appearance. This is the post-op appearance after a cyelastic sling. But the difficulty is in the down gaze where the asymmetry manifests. So um, this is best done, therefore, by bilateral levator excision with bilateral fascial attasling surgery in those who are particular about their uh, uh, jaw winking. And I'll just take one example of which illustrates all these things. So this is a congenital ptosis, severe ptosis, significant excursion, so needs correction, but he has a hypotropia on examination and he has an underaction in the outward gaze in upward direction. So this is a superior rectus underaction. And after an inferior rectus surgery, we could correct his hypotropia, improve his upward excursion in outward gaze and uh, therefore improve the bells. And we could then do a bilateral levator excision with bilateral facial attasling surgery. And we could get a symmetry in primary position, in upward gaze, and in downward gaze to a significant extent with the lag of thermos, which is minimal. And the jaw winking is abolished, of course, with, as with any technique. So a single stage procedure is very much the choice. Now, two stage is no longer needed with the modification that you can carry out. And uh, wherever desired by patient, a bilateral procedure with bilateral fascia lata gives the best results. For all those who would do a, prefer a unilateral surgery, you can do a silastic sling after levator excision. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasturi and Dr. Mili for the excellent case and discussion. And this is the way how we learn from others and seniors. Now, call up next speakers, Dr. Premjit Saunanun. Dr. Premjit is a doctor plastic surgeon and is assistant professor in Chulalongkorn Medical Science University in Bangkok. And her presentation will be discussed by Kat Burkhardt. Kat is one of the finest aesthetic facial plastic surgeon in United States. Dr. Premjit. Over to you, please. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitations. I would like to present my case. Um, um, okay. This is a case of 31 years old female presented with right nephroptosis since childhood and getting worse when she gets older. She had ptosis correction done by levator tucking six months prior by plastic surgeon, but did not improve. She denied history of trauma to her right eye and there was no fluctuations of her eyelid position. On physical examinations, her MRD1 was 2 mm for the right and 4 mm for the left. Her levator function is good with full extraocular movement, and there was no lack on down gaze and no lack of down mass. When instilled 10% phenylephrine to her right eye, the eyelid contour and position is good, with the right eyelid a little bit higher than the left. So she was diagnosed as congenital ptosis with good levator functions and scheduled for muller muscle conjunctiva resections or, uh, or murarectomy of the right eye. In the operating room, after a roll call anesthetic injection and placement of traction suture, her eyelid was flipped and revealed severe conjunctiva scar all over palpable conjunctiva area. Uh, the patients, and she is also a doctor, was asked then about any potential cause of conjunctival scarring, and she recalled a history of chronic conjunctivitis for one week, around six years ago, when she was an intern. And adenoviral conjunctivitis was diagnosed at that time. Murarectomy was carried forward in usual operating technique with six millimeters of resections. The patients come back one week after 
for suture removal with marked swelling of the right eye and difficulty to open her eye. Warm compression was advised and patients was at point for one month. At one month, the bruising went away. Um, I feel that her right eyelid position was better, but the patients felt that the right eyelid was not improved at all. Moreover, she reported diplopia on left gaze with gaze induced tosis. These photos show her extraocular movement. She had my limitations of adduction on her right eye. And when she do, uh, when she adduct the right eye or when she looked to the left, her right eyelid drooped down. With eyelid eversion, there was around one centimeter width of simbephron from the upper tarsal border of uh, to the Baoba Konjang Taiwa. So I would like to ask the panelists at this time, what is your preferred management? And if you prefer to wait and see, what is the good timing for any interventions? I have to add that this patient is not only a doctor, but she also a celebrity who has photo shoot even regularly. So this case induced tosis really bother her. Uh, Dr. Kat, would you come for the discussion, please? Sure. Did Dr. Premjit, did you want me to present here or after the rest of your talk? Uh, I, uh, maybe I, I can finish my talk so we save time. Okay, so I I'll continue my case. Um, actually, I advise the patients to wait for three, four months and keep looking to the left to stretch the conjunctiva. But the patients seek for a second opinion and had subconjunctiva TA injection to the scar area. Uh, Prim, uh, sorry for the interruption. Do you have uh, slides to show us? Uh, yes, you don't see my slides. Yes, yeah, we don't see your slides here. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, let, let me do it again. Yeah, it's there. Thank you. Okay. So um, after um, the TA injections, the eyelid position got worse. Now she report no more diplopia, but when she looked to the left, she feel that there is more ptosis of the right eye. And this is her EOM now. So my question to the panelists is the same. What will you do at this stage? And what is the optimal timing for doing anything in this case? For this case, um, Mechanical process from simbephron was diagnosed and lysis simbephron with amniotic membrane transplantations using fibrin glue was done at four months after the morarectomy. And this is one month post operation. The patient was happy with the result. She had no more ptosis on left case and the MRD1 are now equal. Actually, I'm so glad with her result that I forget to take the photos with left gaze. Thanks that she is a public person. So I managed to find her photos and it seems everything is now all right. And this is a photo comparing before and after lysis of simbephron. You can see that after simbephron lysis, the right eyelid was a little bit higher, about around one millimeter elevated, and now match the left eye. And so this is my last slide. As these are not my routine ptosis evaluations, I want to ask if you think it necessary to ask the patient's potential history to have simbephron, or uh, should I flip the patient eyelid in my clinic for every case before I do morarectomy? And do you think the 
EOM, I mean the full extraocular movement photos necessary for the patient's consult with droopy eyelid. And the last question is, what is your symbephron management um, in terms of to prevent recurrence, such as like what is your preferred graph or what is the um, adjunct medication during the operation and also the course of care? Thank you. Uh, Kat, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you're ready, I guess. Thank yes, you. if you, yes. My slides now. Yeah, it's busy, well. Great, thank you. So, um. Thank you again for allowing me to participate in the session. This was wonderful. And thank you to Dr. Priyamjit for that case. And, and frankly, I thought you did a great job and that patient was very particular and looked beautiful even before the surgery with a very mild ptosis. So I think you started off with a very challenging case to begin with and you did a fantastic job. Um, I actually would not have done anything really too much differently, but I wanted to kind of touch over a few points that you asked. Um, I do not routinely avert eyelids for um, ptosis. Uh, maybe we should, but it's not something I generally do either. The past history is important, but although we typically are taught to ask about dry eyes, glaucoma surgery, um, cicatrizing disorders, I have not actually been very cognizant of asking about a history of a viral infection. And I do have a lower threshold though, however, to change to an external approach if anything appears abnormal. And in this case, for instance, this was a gentleman uh, many years ago who was young, healthy, he had progressive right upper lid ptosis, otherwise very normal, slightly decreased levator function. We did an internal ptosis repair and kind of similarly, very difficult to avert in surgery. So we went external, found the levator to look abnormal. And of course he was biopsied to be B cell lymphoma. So maybe we would have picked this up if we would have averted prior to surgery as well and also if we would have taken note of the slightly decreased levator function. So maybe this is something we should consider doing as you mentioned. So we know EKC adenovirus involves the conjunctiva and cornea and it creates pseudomembranes and in severe cases, subepithelial fibrosis and symblepharon. Now we're familiar with these findings and often if there's tarsal scarring, this can also be seen with trauma or even any surgical excisions, we can see scars like this. and. Theoretically, a conjugalectomy would not involve this area because we're superior to the tarsus. So this should not have affected necessarily the surgery. And if we would have had scarring like this um, in the adenovirus post-op, um, we would have, or post uh, the infection, obviously you would have, or these people would not have performed any CC CMMR. So this would have been an obvious case that you would have not have performed a conjugalectomy. So kind of leads us to think, was the adenovirus history relevant? So I kind of didn't really know. And so I've not seen this before um, in my patients. So I kind of looked at the research uh, literature that shows, for instance, this case demonstrated uh, LASIK surgery five years after EKC and the subepithelial infiltrates occurred three months after surgery. And the question was, was this a reactive inflammation in a sensitized area or activation of dormant viral antigens? And this was another case that they did LASIK three months after EKC and with subepithelial infiltrates one day post-op. And if you look in the literature, there are actually several other reports of this occurring weeks to months prior to surgery. And this was kind of an unusual one that described uh, EKC occurring after eczema laser surgery, no prior history of uh, EKC, but occurred newly afterwards and then developed subsequent recurrence. So does some surgical trauma predispose the patient to either reactivation or a new onset of EKC? And this is unclear. And what I wanted to know is, does this, is this found in a conjugalectomy? And as far as I could see in any literature search, there was no reports of this uh, with patients who have had conjugalectomy or even ptosis surgery. So is this an incidental history? Maybe, maybe not. Very interesting. And so, in this case, I do think surgical technique is very important and also in any, any case that we perform. I do wanna make sure there's also easy aversion. The conjunctiva is very pliable. If you would have, 
or we would have noticed abnormal conjunctiva, a tightness or a scar, then probably would have not necessarily performed the surgery. Um, I do like to make sure the base of the clamp is clear, that it's not close to the globe uh, or clamping too much of the anterior tissues because then you can clamp the levator as well. And really what you're getting is this kind of tissue, right? Superiorly, the fornix conjunctiva that then um, transitions to the bulb or conjunctiva. So in this patient, it looks like the symblepharon literally went from here to here, which is pretty remarkable. And the location was laterally, which usually is a little more lax in terms of the conjunctiva because the tarsal plate is more tapered. So you would have normally noticed a little more laxity. So I'm not sure if, you know, there was just minimal tissue there to begin with in terms of the fornix or just too much excised. Um, but I just found these as interesting findings as, well, what is the fornix depth measurements? And this was a study in Britain and a study in Japan, and they measured the fornix depth to be about 15 millimeters, and that was completely obliterated in this patient. Um, so the question was simple blepharon too. I think you did the right thing. You waited for a long time. You gave it some time. Um, very difficult in this patient since she was a celebrity, wanted to have uh, great results right away. Triamcillin or steroid injection was a good option. I wanted to also just highlight uh, 5-FU possibly as an injection. Um, this was an interview um, that I interviewed Dr. Alan Kahana, who presented this initially at the AAO as a video. You can still see this video online uh, where 5-FU is a very useful in cicatrizing um, conditions, um, especially uh, cicatricial pemphigoid, Stevens-Johnson's, or even something like this could be very useful, sometimes a little more effective than the steroid alone. Um, this can be repeated every few weeks if necessary. And in terms of surgery, um, like you did kind of waited several months, um, amniotic membrane graft is great. I would also have considered a buccal mucous membrane graft or mucous membrane graft, um, making sure that this fornix is tucked superiorly. I would have just passed a like a non-absorbable suture externalized through the skin just to make sure it stays upwards rather than kind of bunches down. But I, I thought you did a great result, very tough case, and I think she looks beautiful. So great job. Thank you. Oh, so in summary, yes, I would um, just biopsy if anything looks abnormal. I do like the external approach sometimes if there's difficulty with uh, any of those um, aversion or anything else that I find unusual. So great job. Thank you very much, Kat, for the great discussion. Uh, this is the time for the discussion. As we have a constraint of time, we'll take only two questions. One question from the Sunny Sen to panelist uh, regarding his direct closure of the coloboma in the upper eyelid coloboma. Uh, he got the thinning of the middle canthal area. Is there any technique to repair the middle canthal waving in that case? Maybe this question can be taken by Ellen McNabb. Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Uh, well, that's a good question. It's, it's a challenging um, thing to, to address. But look, I would uh, probably treat that a little bit like you would in a patient with blepharophimosis. And um, perform something like a Y to V repair. In other words, uh, uh, place the uh, horizontal incision from the canthus across to the point where you want to bring the canthus to, extend the incision into the medial and upper lids just above the lid margins, and then try and advance the canthus and fix it at a point uh, on the periosteum uh, near the lacrimal crest. Having said that, look, the tissues in that particular child looked as if they are very thin and might not hold sutures perhaps as well as you would find in a patient that had something like blepharophimosis. But uh, that would be my thoughts. I'm not sure if, if others might have other suggestions. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, I would pick up one more question, a question from Dr. Havate uh, for Dr. Grover. He asked that for the bilateral frontal sling surgery, is there the better preference technique called the chicken technique over the bilateral sling surgery in uh, Marcus Kanjawi King Tosis. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Um, I answered it to him on the uh, question answer thing. Okay. The, the um, results with chicken beard have sometimes taken a fairly long time for the result to, uh, for the tosis elevation to occur. I have no personal experience with it, but I've been deterred from using it because 
some under corrections have been reported and and it takes a long while for the full correction to come so i don't know how many panelists have an experience with chicken beard and uh, what their experience is ray do you have an experience with that uh, ray may not be able to answer so cat or uh, uh, alan um uh it's not something i've ever done uh, ashok no i've never done a chicken beard procedure um anybody else on the panel who has experience with it zafar has done uh, i think uh, some uh, frontalis procedures uh, in in marcus gun zafar yeah but well, <laughs> i mean uh, i have been doing uh, actually uh, frontalis muscle flap advancement yeah and that i found very useful okay how how long does it take for the full correction to come and uh, um, do you have some percentage of cases where there is an under correction yeah definitely i mean it take about 2 to 3 weeks uh, for the swelling to subside and patient become okay and uh, uh, i mean sometimes we we do go for a bit of under correction Uh, for the reasons that uh, patient if we correct it completely then there is a lot of lag of thalamus etc so uh, our preference is to do a bit of uh, under correction and ask the patient to use the frontalis muscles to bring the two lids together if i'm doing it unilateral but if it is bilateral then that's not the problem so that thing we do or or if there is a there is a case of a double elevator palsy and there is a poor bells then we deliberately do it uh, do the under correction yeah. yeah thank you very much for dr ashok can you wrap up the session with some yeah, i think we had some very interesting cases and uh, i'll just give you uh, the carry home points once again in a couple of minutes i think uh, two or three uh, presentations were on uh, eyelid reconstruction Uh, of large huge cases which have done very well with a combination of skin grafts and the use of flaps either from the uh, midline um, in the um, from the forehead region which are relatively thicker which have to be pared down there are some questions about that whether it displaces the um, eyebrow very much yes it does but i think the cosmesis is acceptable in these patients many of these patients are older where you can take some extra spin as skin and uh, it doesn't really matter if they have a little malposition it's only in the younger patients that it may have a lot of bearing and um, of course uh, there were techniques which zafar illustrated where he used uh, uh, tarso conjunctival uh, graft or tars or uh, periosteal flap and those are all acceptable techniques i showed the case where i had taken the nasal mucocartilage it's just the combination appropriate combination which the surgeon is most used to but he always needs to have a plan b because many many a times when you end up with a resection you find it uh, much more or uh, much different from what you had thought of as plan a so if you are familiar with all the techniques you always end up with the right technique uh this other case was uh, about the jaw winking i think we've spoken enough about that um there are options as per the choice of the patient if it bothers the patient that um, there would be an asymmetry then you need to do a bilateral procedure otherwise you would tend to do a um monoocular procedure and silastic gives us that freedom because I, ma my major concern with unilateral jaw, jaw winking unilateral surgery was the under correction that apparent under correction that you ended up with because of non use of frontalis because of the normal opposite side and uh, because of the greater elasticity of silastic that has been taken care of so whatever whenever patient opts for unilateral surgery i would do a uh silastic uh, surgery i think uh, punima's case uh, um the first case was about the dermoid and i think um, the uh, dermoid and the colobomas and the reconstruction was uh, uh, discussed well the etiology of colobomas was taken up very well by uh, kakizaki 
and uh, again reconstructions the those which are not amenable to direct closure present the difficulty because tissues are not so lax in children and you want to avoid lid sharing procedures in congenital colobomas and that's what presents a difficulty and um, um, you do end up sometimes with notches there are problems like uh, phrases where you have skin growing over the uh, cornea and you need to tackle that you need to put in a mucous membrane graft so congenital colobomas are an entirely different difficult area which needs a lot of handling i think these were largely the cases except for the last one where there was that conjunctival scarring complicating the ptosis surgery and i think these uh, this opens our eyes to the fact that all ptosis cases should be looked at from the inside and uh, if there is any evidence of uh, surface disease or scarring due to past uh, um, inflammation of any kind then you need to be careful with your conjunctival uh, approach procedures particularly and you would prefer a skin approach as dr cat uh, very nicely pointed out thank, thank you, you very much thank you very much dr ashok for the very good inputs for us all the techniques are their own merits and demerits but we have to decide according to given circumstances yeah so with this we will conclude the first session and we'll have a two minutes break and then we'll come back for the guest speakers session now uh, srishti can you play the video yes sir please go on the sun miraculously positioned around 97 million miles from earth any closer or any further and we couldn't exist in our present form so powerful it gives off more energy in 1 second than all earth's people have used since the beginning of time it makes the wind blow the currents flow the rain fall and every living thing grow above all it is totally reliable it has been here from the beginning and it will be here for millions of years to come and it is because of this that we named our company sun pharma and why since our inception we have striven to achieve the same uncompromising reliability and level of trustworthiness of the star we depend on from humble beginnings in 1983 with just two employees and five psychiatry products our company has grown from strength to strength to become the fourth largest generic pharmaceutical company in the world selling over 2000 products in 150 countries we employ over 30000 people representing over 50 cultures in six different continents Every year we sell over 30 billion doses covering a wide range of treatment alternatives from cough and cold to cancer to reliable ARVs that give hope to millions of AIDS sufferers on a daily basis to a solution for psoriasis to oncology and dermatology and so much more Our significant investment in R&D beginning 3 decades ago enabled us to make technology our key differentiator and develop a basket of robust yet technically complex products designed for diverse markets across the world. Today, we have a team of around 2000 world-class scientists working in state-of-the-art R&D centers spread across the globe. We consider it paramount that wherever in the world we research, develop, manufacture, test or distribute our products, quality will always be of the highest standard. At Sun, there is no substitute for quality. Based on our core values of reliability, quality, innovation, trust and consistency, we are able to deliver on our vision of reaching people and touching lives globally as a leading provider of valued medicines. and much like the star our planet depends on for life we will rise and shine every day to the benefit of all mankind sun farmer reaching people touching lives
Dr. Rohit, do we go to the next session? Kasturi, over to you. Okay. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Again, I take this privilege of introducing a gem of European facial aesthetic and oculoplastic playing field, Dr. Francesco Quarantalioni. Dr. Francesco needs no introduction, but to mention a few of his accolades, Dr. Leone is the president of the European Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and has been the past president and past secretary of the Italian Oculoplastic Surgery Society. He is also the director of the Adnexion and Orbital Services in the Department of Ophthalmology of Villa Tiberia Hospital in Rome. Dr. Leone, we have heard so much about your work and attended multiple of your instruction courses in multiple international congresses. So it's an absolute delight to hear you live today. So friends and colleagues, let's give a warm heartfelt welcome to Dr. Leone. Thank you very much. Thank to all of you. Thanks to Kasturi, to Roy, and to Raul for inviting me. It is a great honor to be here with so many talented speakers uh, representing not only myself, but also the European society. So I, th I hope you can see my slides so I can start. Okay, so uh, I, uh, we decided together that I could talk about upper halitosis repair and blepharoplasty indications at, and technique. No financial disclosures unfortunately anyway i mean the, the what's the topic the topic is you you have many kind of ptosis as you can see here and most patients have associated upper lead dermatocalasis so the big question is how to manage both how to make these patients happy as we all know we've seen a lot of previous talks we have several types of, of ptosis operation Mueller's muscle resection of course, the eponeurosis advancement, levator resection, although mainly for congenital ptosis, frontalis link, which in adults can be used for myogenic ptosis, as you can see in these slides. Then the frontalis flap, which is quite used as we, it has just been mentioned in China and has become more popular in Western Europe and the United States and in Brazil recently. Then there is the conjoint fascial sheath suspension. I have no experience at all in this technique, but I've been told has gone almost viral in China and South Korea. So it might be interesting even in Western patients, probably. But when we are talking about associated ptosis and uh, blepharocal dermatocalasis, so how to manage both at the same time, at least in Europe and in the United States, we are thinking about either Mueller's muscle resection and or aponeurosis advancement. This is a, a, a typical lady. So this is an Italian lady in her early 40s. And what is she complaining of? Many uh, these kind of patients come over and they complain of the excess skin in, their, in her left upper lid. So she's quite happy about her right upper lid just complaining of a double skin fall, which is not very pleasant. But what should we look at when we look at this patient? Of course, there is an excess skin, but there is a higher skin crease on the right hand side, which might be suggestive of an aponeurosis dehiscence or disinsertion. And, there is, uh, and we have to have a look at the brow height. If the, the brow is elevated, like in this case, we have several additional information. So there is a good frontalis action, 
So this is a very important thing. And also, if the mimic is preserved, we do know that this lady did not have Botox injection, at least on the left upper uh, left eyebrow. So what can we do? Another thing is to have a look at the pupil of the patient. So this seems to be a very, very similar cases. There is a brow elevation and aptosis, a very mild ptosis on the left-hand side. But as you can see, the only difference between, between the two cases is the size of the pupil. So what's the difference? Uh, think about it because the management is absolutely different. And in these two cases, cosmetic surgery comes later, at a later stage, possibly. So the first one is obvi obviously a Horner syndrome. And the second case is a partial ternary palsy. So absolutely, uh, completely different. And also, uh, as I've heard from very interesting previous talk, we should have a, a look of the conjunctival side in every kind of ptosis. But two things that are extremely important are the herring's law and the ocular dominance. And why? You see what happens when uh, with a, an old lady with bilateral dermatocalasis and bilateral ptosis, which is obviously worse on the left uh, side. And you see what, what happens when my assistant raises her left upper lid. So the right upper lid drops completely. And another thing which is extremely important is to check in each of these patients, which is the dominant eye, because we do know that ptosis in the dominant eye is related to higher incidence of Herring's phenomenon, and also that levator muscle tone is influenced by ocular dominance, and this uh, is even more evident if ptosis is present. This seems to be quite a difficult concept, but it's not that difficult. You see what happens. If there is a, a bilateral ptosis, like in this patient, but ptosis is worse in the dominant eye, then we do know that unfortunately, the contralateral upper eyelid tends to get lower in a more evident way. And again, what does it mean? It does mean that we should overcorrect the non-dominant eye at surgery. We know that ptosis is adjustable surgery on the table if we do an anterior approach. And even if I did that, you see what happens after one month. So the right up, the left upper lid was overcorrected at surgery, but not that much. And so if the right eye is highly dominant, you can observe a drop in the left upper lid. And even if you reoperate the patient, you might obtain a reasonably good result, reasonably, but not an excellent result. It's a good result in terms of brow height, because he's a male and he doesn't want a brow lift, is a, a reasonable result in terms of tarsal plate show, so the skin show. But if you have a careful look, you will see that after two operations, the left upper lid is quite high, but almost high or low enough as preoperatively. So two operation to improve global appearance, but not to improve very much the height of the left upper lid. Sometimes, instead, we get a help from ocular dominance. Like in this lady, you can see that if the levator muscle is influenced by ocular dominance, if ptosis is present, but, and the ocular dominance sometimes is stronger than ptosis. It does mean that sometimes you have a paradoxic elevation of the brow when there is no ptosis. So in this patient, you should observe a raised left upper lid. Instead, it's the opposite. How could you treat these patients? In a very simple way, overcorrecting at surgery the left upper lid, the one with the ptosis, and after one month, you could have this result with just a one eye operation. So this is just an exception to the rule, wherever we should prefer bilateral surgery. When you have this kind of phenomenon, I would prefer unilateral surgery with overcorrection of the non-dominant eye. And again, sometimes you have another thing to make things a little bit more complicated. You see, this is a quite oldish lady in her mid sixties with a, a bilateral dermatocalasis, a right dominant eye, and the dermatocalasis is more evident on the right eye, but on the left eye, there is a mild ptosis. So we did in this lady, what I did in this lady was a Mueller muscle resection in the left eye and a, a, 
and in, in the same stage, abelantara upper lid blepharoplasty, but you see that even under local anesthesia, there is a, a right, and even after ptosis correction on the left side, there is a right, uh, uh, there is an elevation of the right eyebrow. So sometimes uh, ocular dominance is stronger than dermatochalasis and is stronger than increase of the levator or the muller muscle tone caused by ptosis, presence of ptosis. And in the end, you can obtain a reasonable result, checking always the height of the lid, the skin show, and the elevation of the eyebrow, which is more symmetric, even if there is a slight elevation, even a couple of months postoperatively on the right-hand side. Also, we should always remember that the attempt for symmetry should not determine contralateral hypercorrection. And to make things a little bit more complicated, uh, you, let's have a look at these two patients. These, are the, these two are anophthalmic patients. And even if the left eye is the non-seeing eye with the prosthesis, you see that there is an elevation of the eyebrow. So why does this happen? Uh, ipsilateral brow elevation in an ophthalmic totic patients may be due to a known visual pathway afferent into the feedback loop, regulating compensating brow elevation in bilateral ptosis. So both Mueller and levator muscle stretch may be sensed by another structure that is a proprioceptive appropriate, appropriate structure. And so light might not be the primary bra driver if there is the presence of an ipsilateral brow. So light is not the only uh, stimulation which is necessary to raise the eyebrow. We, there is also a proprioceptive phenomenon. Also, when we have to deal with anophthalmic patients, we always have to check, of course, the socket. So sometimes uh, a secondary ball implant, like in this case, is enough to restore the appearance of the patient. So we don't need, we don't need lid surgery at all. In other cases, there is another important principle to remember that these patients are very proud of the dermatochalasis. This lady told me it took ages to her to get this excess of skin and they're just obsessed with symmetry. So restoring of the volume and upper lid height and brow position are essential to restore symmetry and they do not want uh, a blepharoplasty. So I would refrain to offer a blepharoplasty to a lady like this unless I'm required of that. Same thing for this lady obsessed by symmetry, but to restore the volume and to give a similar appearance is enough. So never attempt to treat the fellow eye unless you are requested to do so. And again, if you have to do ptosis and blepharoplasty, remember that ptosis in this kind of patients is just the cherry on the cake. So it's just the final uh, operation of a multi-stage multi approach. So this patient had, uh, had a volume, uh, orbital flow repair, had a, a volume enhancement with the dermis fat graft, had a fascial sling to restore the, and tighten the lower lid, and had a skin graft uh, from the right upper lid to the lower, uh, lower uh, left lower lid. And so this is the free blepharoplasty, which you can see here. And just ptosis correction is the final operation, the final step. It's always important to remember this. And also remember that in anophthalmic patients, the volume is the key. But let's go to the bulk of this talk. Uh, when in Italy and in Europe, we are talking about ptosis and, and cosmetic surgery, we are mainly thinking of these two operations, either the aponeurosis advancement or the Mueller's muscle resection, as I have mentioned. So which is best? Is there really a best procedure? I always want a positive phenylephrine response to do to perform a Mueller muscle resection, as in this case, and you have very good result with a very easy operation, which is no more than 15 minutes long. But which is best? So you can see in these slides the pros and cons of each operation. So we have to choose for each patient. In the United States, according to what I think, there is a, a little bias. I, I mean, Mueller's muscle resection 
is, is very much performed. In my practice, it will be about one third of mitosis correction. But in the United States, some insurance uh, companies, <clears throat> excuse me, recognize uh, Mueller muscle resection as a second operation uh, when you, they perform cosmetic surgery in the upper lid. So there might be a, a slight bias. According to me, you have to select each patient. So if you have a gentleman in his early 50s, come for mainly for lower lid blepharoplasty and just his request to have uh, upper lids a little bit wide open, then of course you can do a mini upper lid blepharoplasty and you can do a Mueller muscle resection and you will get a couple of millimeters more to widen uh, he, uh, the aperture of the ease of his eyes. But if you have a lady in the in late 40s who is coming for a symmetry of the upper lids and she complains of headache of an over wrinkle in her forehead, then what should you do? What should you do? Of course, what I would do in this lady is an aponeuro left aponeurosis advancement and uh, an upper lid blepharoplasty, and of course, a lower lid, lower lid blepharoplasty if she's keen on that. And you can see that the not, not to overdo, don't do a brow lift, please, in these cases, because if you perform a levator advancement, you can see that you can achieve a normal position of the brow at the same time. And of course, again, if you have a case like this, uh, you, we should try to perform the same, thing, the same thing, but if there is a very strong left eye dominance, like in this case, even if you perform the left aponeurosis advancement together with the upper lid blepharoplasty, you may not achieve a satisfactory result. And in this case, on the table, you decide and you go for a right, right brow pexy at the same time. So. Let's try to decide sometimes on the table. Let's try to ward the patients, but let's not try to overdo. Uh, less is best in oculoplastic patients. So how to manage both? Please remember the concept of the eye dominance. Remember the importance of Herring's phenomenon. Remember that there is a proprioceptive phenomenon, mainly in anophthalmic patients, but not only in anophthalmic patients. The importance, the importance of the tarsal show and the importance of brow descent. How to manage both? Decide the best for each patient. Don't be influenced that one operation is better than another one and try to make all the patients smile. Thank you very much for your attention and I really hope that in the next year we'll be able to organize something together, the European Society together with APs Alperts. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Francesco. It was wonderful. And uh, can I call upon Dr. Ellen Begne for please to give the learning point summary of this uh, above lecture? Well, thank you very much <laughs> for the opportunity to comment on uh, a really excellent presentation, Francesco. I feel a little bit like Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. Uh, or should I say, Daniel, uh, being thrown in front of 40 lions, 40 leone. <laughs> um, yes. You've, you've really presented a, a very complex and difficult topic in a very succinct way and highlighted uh, the subtleties and the difficulties faced when dealing with um, patients with ptosis and also other features that they may wish to have addressed at the same time. And I think by highlighting some of those subtleties and features which we all should uh, uh, assess in our patients, including their, uh, their pupils, their brow position. Uh, I certainly think it's important to evert lids in patients, particularly if you're anticipating doing a conjunctival Muller's resection. Uh, the amount of pre tarsal show, uh, the position, relative position of the skin crease on both sides, uh, look for Herring's law effects, um, and plan appropriately for those, and also ocular dominance, something which we've come to appreciate uh, more in recent years with some of the publications which you've highlighted and very nicely illustrated in your talk. Of course, ptosis uh, could be discussed as a whole topic of a whole webinar for days or even hours or weeks on end. It's an enormous topic, mm -hmm. and I think uh, we all 
uh, in dealing with ptosis recognize the challenges um, and the subtleties that sh which we have to address. And I think you have uh, very nicely demonstrated that with your presentation, Francesco. I really can't think what more I could add to that uh, presentation, but other than to thank you for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you can teach me something about the conjoint <laughs> sheet operation, which I, I don't know how to do. I'd like to come uh, over to Asia Pacific region. I'm not, uh, no, I'm not familiar with it, so you'll have to see if someone else on the panel might be able to give some guidance on that. It's not something that's in my repertoire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alain. Yeah, both of you are so great and we have lots of things to learn from you all. And now, uh, uh, Srishti, can we have the slide of third webinar? Uh, announcement about the first Singapore Sopers and third AP Sopers webinar is going to held on 4th of December, Friday, 2020. Please block your calendar for this day. Uh, there are other big names, Dr. Naresh Joshi and Dr. Jose Raul Montes are giving their logic and leadership in side-by-side -side rejuvenation of the perioperal area to cut or to fill surgical or not surgical. So there are very well known, our friends are doing the moderation of this webinar. And now we'll have uh, audience polling regarding the second webinar. Uh, I would like to invite you kindly participate in this poll. Thank you, Sristi, please polling. The polling is live. Everyone can vote now. I cannot click. Yeah, same thing. Not being able to click. Um, I cannot so click. The organizers, things. actually the hosts and co-hosts are not able to vote. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so okay. Okay. Everyone oh. got it. <laughs> May I just say that uh, it was very educative to listen to Francesco, those subtle points of herrings and brow action and the uh, tassel plate show. Uh, I've learned a lot. So grateful to Francesco. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rash. I see that uh, someone has closed uh, the poll abruptly. So I request all the co-hosts who are present here to not show the results till the poll has ended. So I'll notify everyone when the poll has ended and we can finally show the verdict to our attendees. Uh, so I see that 37% of our attendees have already voted. So attendees, please, uh, please take a couple minutes of your time and uh, answer our feedback form. This will help us to improve the for future webinars from ASPOSRS. So we humbly request you to participate in this poll.
Christy, how long this will take? So 50% of us have voted. So do we want to close it? Um, so if you want it, I can close it right now. Yeah, if there is no more option are coming. Rohit, maybe you can answer some questions in the meanwhile that the audience has asked. Uh, can I take a question from the first session? Uh, this is a question from Sue Ho uh, regarding the presentation of Purnima. How you how do you avoid eyebrow level rise in glabular flap and in also in cosmetic outcome? Lies a fear with advancement flap would that yield a better cosmetic out, outcome? This is a question on the Purnima. Maybe uh, Dr. Ashok, maybe you, you would like to take this question. Yeah, I took it up uh, a little bit in during the discussion. Yes, right, you did, you the did. brow position, and less is fair, is a good technique for smaller defects. But a defect of this size, I would prefer to close it. Um, a, the options of flaps and grafts would be open. The midline forehead flaps are relatively thick flaps. And yes, they do affect the brow position. They bring them together. They can also change their position. But usually in older patients, there is enough stretching not to lead to something very deform deforming. And um, therefore, and you are working in cases which have big tumors. So I think um, the um, cosmosis is fairly acceptable in those situations with the changes that take place in the brow position. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashok. Uh, Srishti, probably we have done with the question. Okay, so yeah. I'll end it and make the results slide. Right, it will take some time, yeah? Okay. Or you can show instantly. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm showing the results. All right, good. So thank you very much, Srishti. Now we are at the end of the today's webinar. And as an organizer, I had obligated to make a vote of thanks to all of you, especially. I'm very much thankful to my friend, Raul Hansen, who agreed with me to organize second webinar together and all the executive team uh, who helped me a lot to organize this. And I'm especially thankful to Francisco Quaranta Leone uh, who agreed to be a guest speaker in this second webinar on AP Soppers and gave a very new concept during the surgery and blepharoptosis and blepharoplasty together. So maybe some of us are not very much aware about the herring's dominance and what you have mentioned, other factor. That's why always we customize the patient, not always given as a standard procedure in the book is not fit for everyone. So I like your statement that in octoplasty, less is best. So we'll try to follow that. And I would like to thank uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Kasturi, from the beginning of my octoplastic surgery career. Uh, I learned a lot from her and we were together in many uh, conferences in India as well as in abroad. And the same way, I would like to thank my our panelists, Dr. Ashok Grover, Dr. Ellen McNabb, Kat Burkhardt, Hirohiko Kakizaki, and Kevin Chong. And special thanks to all the speakers who did the wonderful presentation with an excellent, interesting talk by Dr. Yuni Airawati, Dr. Jafarul Islam, Dr. Sunny Sen, Dr. Mm -hmm. Shaukat Shakur, Dr. Premjit Shaunan, and Dr. Purnima Rajkarnikar. In the same way, I would like to thank our sponsor who organized all these things, uh, bearing all the burden of the financial constraint by Sun Pharma. In the same way, for the IT and event management responsibility has taken by Genesis Solution and Tilinga Insurance Ophthalmology Academic Team as well as the uh, IT team. So from the organizing team being the, one of the member, uh, once again, I would like to thanks from heart of, uh, bottom of 
my heart to all of you. And we would like to see you in the next third APSOPS webinar on 4th of December, 2020. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rohit, for bringing it together so beautifully and conducting it so beautifully. Thank you, Rohit. Thanks, Rohit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you again. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.